Chapter 34 Arthur remained at the gate while Ruth climbed Maria's front steps. She heard the rapid click of the typewriter, and when Martin let her in, found him on the last page of a manuscript. She had come to make certain whether or not he would be at their table for Thanksgiving dinner. But before she could broach the subject, Martin plunged into one with which he was full. "'Here, let me read you this,' he cried, separating the carbon copies and running the pages of manuscript into shape. "'It's my latest, and different from anything I've done. It is so altogether different that I'm almost afraid of it. And yet I've a sneaking idea it is good. You be the judge. It's a Hawaiian story. It's called Weeki Weeki.' His face was bright with the creative glow, Though she shivered in the cold room and had been struck by the coldness of his hands at greeting, she listened closely while he read, and though he from time to time had seen only disapprobation in her face, at the close he asked, Frankly, what do you think of it? I, I don't know, she answered. Will it, do you think it will sell? I'm afraid not, was the confession. It's too strong for the magazines, but it's true, on my word it's true. "'But why do you persist in writing such things when you know they won't sell?' she went on inexorably. "'The reason for your writing is to make a living, isn't it?' "'Yes, that's right. But the miserable story got away with me. I couldn't help writing it. It demanded to be written.' "'But that character, that weeky weeky, why do you make him talk so roughly? Surely it will offend your readers, and surely that is why the editors are justified in refusing your work.' because the real Weeki Weeki would have talked that way. But it is not in good taste. It is life, he replied bluntly. It is real, it is true, and I must write life as I see it. She made no answer, and for an awkward moment they sat silent. It was because he loved her that he did not quite understand her, and she could not understand him because he was so large that he balked beyond her horizon. "'Well, I've collected from the transcontinental,' he said in an effort to shift the conversation to a more comfortable subject. The picture of the bewhiskered trio, as he had last seen them, mulked it of four dollars and ninety cents and a ferry ticket, made him chuckle. "'Then you'll come,' she cried joyously. "'That is what I came to find out.' "'Come?' he muttered absently. "'Where?' "'Why, to dinner tomorrow.' You know you said you'd recover your suit if you got that money. I forgot all about it, he said humbly. You see, this morning the poundman got Maria's two cows and the baby calf, and, well, it happened that Maria didn't have any money, and so I had to recover her cows for her. That's where the transcontinental fiver went. The ring of bells went into the poundman's pocket. Then you won't come. He looked down at his clothing. I can't. Tears of disappointment and reproach glistened in her blue eyes, but she said nothing. "'Next Thanksgiving you'll have dinner with me in Delmonico's,' he said cheerily. "'Or in London or Paris, or anywhere you wish, I know it.' "'I saw in the paper a few days ago,' she announced abruptly, "'that there had been several local appointments to the railway mail. You passed first, didn't you?' He was compelled to admit that the call had come for him but that he had declined it. I was so sure, I am so sure of myself, he concluded. A year from now I'll be earning more than a dozen men in the railway mail. You wait and see. Oh, was all she said when he finished. She stood up, pulling at her gloves. I must go, Martin. Arthur is waiting for me. He took her in his arms and kissed her, but she proved a passive sweetheart. There was no tenseness in her body. Her arms did not go around him, and her lips met his, without their wonted pressure. She was angry with him, he concluded, as he returned from the gate. But why? It was unfortunate that the poundman had gobbled Maria's cows, but it was only a stroke of fate. Nobody could be blamed for it. Nor did it enter his head, that he could have done aught otherwise than what he had done. Well, yes, he was to blame a little, was his next thought for having refused the call to the railway mail, but she had not liked Weeki Weeki. 
he turned at the head of the steps to meet the letter-carrier on his afternoon round. The ever-recurrent fever of expectancy assailed Martin as he took the bundle of long envelopes. One was not long, it was short and thin, and outside was printed the address of the New York Outview. He paused in the act of tearing the envelope open. It would not be an acceptance. He had no manuscripts with that publication. Perhaps. His heart almost stood still at the wild thought. Perhaps they were ordering an article from him. But the next instant he dismissed the surmise as hopelessly impossible. It was a short formal letter, signed by the office editor, merely informing him that an anonymous letter which they had received was enclosed, and that he could rest assured the Outview staff never under any circumstances gave consideration to anonymous correspondence. The enclosed letter Martin found to be crudely printed by hand. It was a hodgepodge of illiterate abuse of Martin, and of assertion that the so-called Martin Eden, who was selling stories to magazines, was no writer at all, and that in reality he was stealing stories from old magazines, typing them, and sending them out as his own. The envelope was postmarked San Leandro. Martin did not require a second thought to discover the author. Higginbotham's grammar, Higginbotham's colloquialisms, Higginbotham's mental quirks and processes were apparent throughout. Martin saw in every line not the fine Italian hand, but the coarse grocer's fist of his brother-in-law. But why? He vainly questioned. What injury had he done Bernard Higginbotham? The thing was so unreasonable, so wanton. There was no explaining it. In the course of the week a dozen similar letters were forwarded to Martin by the editors of various Eastern magazines. The editors were behaving handsomely, Martin concluded. He was wholly unknown to them, yet some of them had even been sympathetic. It was evident that they detested anonymity. He saw that the malicious attempt to hurt him had failed. In fact, if anything came of it, it was bound to be good, for at least his name had been called to the attention of a number of editors. Somewhere, some time, perhaps, reading a submitted manuscript of his, they might remember him as the fellow about whom they had received an anonymous letter. And who was to say that such a remembrance might not sway the balance of their judgment just a trifle in his favor? It was about this time that Martin took a great slump in Maria's estimation. He found her in the kitchen one morning, groaning with pain, tears of weakness running down her cheeks, vainly endeavoring to put through a large ironing. He promptly diagnosed her affliction as la grippe, closed her with hot whiskey, the remnants in the bottles for which Brissenden was responsible, and ordered her to bed. But Maria was refractory. The ironing had to be done, she protested, and delivered that night, or else there would be no food on the morrow for the seven small and hungry Silvas. To her astonishment, and it was something that she never ceased from relating to her dying day, she saw Martin Eden seize an iron from the stove and throw a fancy shirtwaist on the ironing board. It was Kate Flanagan's best Sunday waist, than whom there was no more exacting and fastidiously dressed woman in Maria's world. Also, Miss Flanagan had sent special instructions that said waist must be delivered by that night. As every one knew, she was keeping company with John Collins, the blacksmith, and, as Maria knew privily, Miss Flanagan and Mr. Collins were going next day to Golden Gate Park. Vain was Maria's attempt to rescue the garment. Martin guided her tottering footsteps to a chair, from where she watched him with bulging eyes. In a quarter of the time it would have taken her, she saw the shirtwaist safely ironed, and ironed as well as she could have done it, as Martin made her grant. "'I could work faster,' he explained if your irons were only hotter. To her, the irons he swung were much hotter than she ever dared to use. Your sprinkling is all wrong, he complained next. Here, let me teach you how to sprinkle. Pressure is what's wanted. Sprinkle under pressure if you want to iron fast. He procured a packing case from the woodpile in the cellar, fitted a cover to it, and raided the scrap iron the Silva tribe was collecting for the junkman. 
he fresh sprinkled garments in the box, covered with the board and pressed by the iron, the device was complete and in operation. Now you watch me, Maria, he said, stripping off to his undershirt and gripping an iron that was what he called really hot. And when he finished the iron, he washed the wools, as she described it afterward. He say, Maria, you are the great a fool. I show a you how to wash the wools, and he show a me too. Ten minutes he make a the machine, one barrel, one wheel hub, two poles, just a like dat. Martin had learned the contrivance from Joe at the Shelley Hot Springs. The old wheel hub, fixed on the end of the upright pole, constituted the plunger. Making this, in turn, fast to the spring pole attached to the kitchen rafters, so that the hub played upon the woolens in the barrel, he was able, with one hand, thoroughly to pound them. No more Maria wash a de wools, her story always ended. I make a de kids work a de pole and a hub and a barrel. Him be smart a man, Mr. Eden. Nevertheless, by his masterly operation and improvement of her kitchen laundry, he fell an immense distance in her regard. The glamour of romance with which her imagination had invested him faded away in the cold light of fact that he was an ex-laundry man. All his books and his grand friends who visited him in carriages or with countless bottles of whiskey went for naught. He was, after all, a mere working man, a member of her own class and caste. He was more human and approachable, but he was no longer mystery. Martin's alienation from his family continued. Following upon Mr. Higginbotham's unprovoked attack, Mr. Hermann von Schmidt showed his hand. The fortunate sale of several storiettes, some humorous verse, and a few jokes gave Martin a temporary splurge of prosperity. Not only did he partially pay up his bills, but he had sufficient balance left to redeem his black suit and wheel. The latter, by virtue of a twisted crank hanger, required repairing, and, as a matter of friendliness with his future brother-in-law, he sent it to von Schmidt's shop. The afternoon of the same day, Martin was pleased by the wheel being delivered by a small boy. Von Schmidt was also inclined to be friendly, was Martin's conclusion from this unusual favor. Repaired wheels usually had to be called for, but when he examined the wheel, he discovered no repairs had been made. A little later in the day he telephoned his sister's betrothed, and learned that the person didn't want anything to do with him in any shape, manner, or form. Hermann von Schmidt, Martin answered cheerfully, I've a good mind to come over and punch that Dutch nose of yours. You come up to my shop, came the reply, and I'll send for the police, and I'll put you through, too. Oh, I know you, but you can't make no rough house with me. I don't want nothing to do with the likes of you. You're a loafer, that's what and I ain't asleep. You ain't going to do no sponging off me just because I'm marrying your sister. Why don't you go to work and earn an honest living, eh? Answer me that. Martin's philosophy asserted itself, dissipating his anger, and he hung up the receiver with a long whistle of incredulous amusement. But after the amusement came the reaction, and he was oppressed by his loneliness. Nobody understood him, Nobody seemed to have any use for him, except Brissenden, and Brissenden had disappeared, God only knew where. Twilight was falling as Martin left the fruit store and turned homeward, his marketing on his arm. At the corner an electric car had stopped, and at the sight of a lean familiar figure alighting, his heart leapt with joy. It was Brissenden, and in the fleeting glimpse, ere the car pulled up, Martin noted the overcoat pockets, one bulging with books, the other bulging with a quart bottle of whiskey. End of chapter 34